D.E.V. Cordigalair, my name is James Nagel, welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. On the outbreak of the First World War, the officers of the British Army were drawn mainly from the gentry and the upper middle class, where connections and wealth were as important, if not more so, than actual aptitude for a position of leadership. But the war required a massive expansion of the army, and as it continued long past Christmas of 1914, they would have to look to the lower orders to fill the gaps. Men who had worked as clerks, labourers and grocers' assistants in peacetime were given temporary commissions for the duration of the war, and as they were killed they were replaced by young and unskilled teenagers who had never held a job before joining the army. Demobilised in the aftermath of the war, these temporary gentlemen found it hard to settle back into civilian life. They had been respected officers on good pay and were now expected to go back to menial jobs, if those jobs even still existed. Britain was suffering from massive unemployment and an advert looking for ex-officers to manage a coffee stall for two pounds and ten shillings a week received over five thousand applications. But soon a greater opportunity would present itself in Ireland. Following a surge in IRA violence culminating in the destruction of over 300 abandoned RIC barracks in April of 1920, the Secretary of State for War, Winston Churchill, suggested the establishment of a special emergency gendarmerie at a cabinet meeting on the 11th of May. The idea was initially rejected, but was later revived by Churchill's close friend and the new police adviser, Lieutenant General Sir Hugh Tudor, to rapidly reinforce the police in Ireland. In July, adverts began to appear in London looking for ex-officers with first-class records, courage, discretion, tact and judgement to join the Auxiliary Division of the Royal Irish Constabulary. With pay of £1 per day and expenses, over 1,000 applications were received in the first week for what was nicknamed Tudor's Tufts. Successful applicants would be given a year-long contract and the rank of Temporary Cadet, and dispatched to the Curra for six weeks training. When their commander, Brigadier General Frank Crozier, visited them for the first time, he found them in a state of misery, inconvenience and hard drinking due to poor conditions. Their recruitment had been so rushed that proper quarters or canteen facilities hadn't been put in place for them. By the end of August, four auxiliary companies were dispatched to the most disturbed areas of the country, and in total, 21 companies of between 40 to 80 temporary cadets would serve throughout Ireland. The auxiliary uniform consisted of a tamashanther or balmoral cap, an armband bearing the initials TC, and any British police or military uniform they chose. Many pictures from the time show an eclectic mix of uniforms, often Air Force, whose ex-officers were well represented, and the auxiliaries would often be mistaken for the black and tans, especially after the latter were fitted with proper RIC uniforms in late 1920. While they would often work together, the black and tans were a static force which reacted to IRA activity, while the auxiliaries were conceived of as a highly mobile strike force which would carry out counterinsurgency operations such as raids and seek and destroy missions. In taking the fight to the IRA, the auxiliaries would be aided by the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act, introduced following the collapse of the summer assizes when coroner's inquests had condemned the actions of the British administration and jurors had refused to attend court cases. Passed on the 9th of August, as the first auxiliaries were arriving in Ireland, the Act allowed for trial by jury to be replaced by courts martial and established military courts of inquiry in place of coroner's inquests. These measures led to an immediate increase in convictions, but they would also facilitate the cover-up of murders carried out by British Crown forces. In September, the auxiliaries carried out their first operations, and on the 19th they raided an IRA training camp in the Dublin Mountains. Members of the General Headquarters staff were attending a demonstration of War Flower, an explosive substance developed by the IRA Director of Chemicals, Seamus O'Donovan, but the depot company of the auxiliaries, based in Beggar's Bush Barracks, had received intelligence about the session and in a well-planned operation were able to surprise the camp guards. Rory O'Connor and the IRA Chief of Staff Richard Mulcahy narrowly escaped capture, but 40 men were arrested and another, Sean Doyle, was shot dead. With intelligence from Ormond Winther's Raid Bureau and backed by the powers granted under the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act, the Auxiliary scored a number of early successes, forcing the IRA to adapt if they were to survive. 
no longer able to stay in their homes. Many IRA men were forced to go on the run, travelling between safe houses to avoid capture and living off the support of the local population. They now became full-time revolutionaries and began to establish the legendary Flying Columns. Formed in active parts of the country since June and often consisting of little more than a dozen men, the Flying Columns were a natural solution to the more aggressive tactics of the auxiliaries. Most of the remaining RIC barracks were now too well defended to be attacked following reinforcement by the Black and Tans, and so the IRA turned their attention to ambushing patrols and supply convoys. Short, devastating attacks with high casualty rates from which the IRA were able to retreat in good order, these ambushes frustrated the auxiliaries and led to reprisals against the local population. Although they would cause outrage in the British and international media, General Tudor returned from numerous meetings with the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, confident that he had government sanction for a campaign of reprisals which often descended into drunken looting, burning and murder. Declaring the IRA to be a disloyal criminal minority in breach of the laws of war for not wearing a distinctive uniform and hiding among civilians, the British forces argued that reprisals were a legitimate way of making the IRA comply with these rules in future, or, failing that, that reprisals were necessary to maintain discipline and morale. With the military courts of inquiry now stacked in their favour, many of their worst atrocities would be covered up or even blamed on the IRA. The majority of the auxiliaries were young, inexperienced men who had signed up for adventure or because this was the only employment open to them other than selling matches or begging, which many ex-soldiers were forced to resort to. The average age of an auxiliary in Ireland was just 20, and over 90% of them had never held a job outside the army. Of the 2,100 men who served throughout the War of Independence, some 10% of them were Irish-born, joining to escape unemployment or for safety as violence against ex-British forces grew. While they were envisaged as an elite special forces unit made up of the best of the best, their youth, inexperience and the hostile environment they found themselves in led to severe indiscipline. Brigadier General Crozier estimated that the men spent up to 70% of their weekly wages on alcohol and reprisals often began with the looting of public houses. In total, 44 auxiliaries would be killed by the IRA during the course of the War of Independence, though another five would die by suicide. The chances of a patrol being ambushed were low, but once attacked, the chances of making it out unscathed were even lower, as with the Kilmichael ambush in November of 1920, where 17 members of an 18-man patrol were shot dead. After the war, some would look for more adventure, moving on to Palestine to serve in the British Mandate, though others, such as John Charles Reynolds, would remain in Ireland. An English-born auxiliary who provided the IRA with information, Reynolds served with the National Army during the Irish Civil War and later served as a Garda detective in 1933. Disbanded in April of 1922, other ex-auxiliaries would go on to serve in the Ulster Special Constabulary and the RUC. The British government viewed the situation in Ireland as a policeman's job, and the likes of Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, feared that deploying the army to combat the IRA would lead to unrest throughout the Empire, as the United Kingdom would be in effect admitting that it was in a state of civil war. While thousands of British soldiers were stationed in Ireland during the War of Independence, they mainly acted as an aid to the civil powers, establishing checkpoints or assisting in large roundups. Some units, however, would develop counterinsurgency courses and go on the offensive themselves against the IRA, most notably the Essex Regiment based at Bandon, led by the intelligence officer of the 1st Battalion, Major Arthur Percival. On the 25th of July 1920, Detective Sergeant William Mulhern, the RIC's Chief Intelligence Officer in West Cork, was shot dead by the IRA on the porch of St. Patrick's Church while on his way to Mass. Expecting reprisals, members of the IRA were detailed to protect a number of houses in the vicinity, including that of the local brigade intelligence officer, Sean Buckley, which was just 500 yards from Bandon military barracks. On the night of the 27th of July, Major Percival personally led a raid on the building. The defenders opened fire, killing Lance Corporal Thomas Maddox, after which they retreated. Earlier that day, 
the officer commanding the 3rd Cork Brigade, Tom Hales, and its quartermaster, Pat Hart, had been captured and beaten by the Essex Regiment, and following Maddox's death, they would be tortured further. The prisoners were struck with rifles and had their nails pulled out with pliers, but never divulged any information. Hart, forced by the Essex Regiment to wave a Union Jack in a photograph which clearly shows that his nose has been shattered, never recovered from the torture, dying in an asylum a few years later. Hales would spend the rest of the war in prison and was replaced by Charlie Hurley as the new brigade officer commanding. In need of a training officer, Hurley turned to a young man still held in some suspicion for his service with the British Army during the First World War, Tom Barry. Following a training camp in October, the men under Barry's command ambushed an Essex Regiment convoy at Turin. Three soldiers were killed, including their commanding officer, Lieutenant William Alfred Dixon, and four were wounded before they surrendered. This would be the first in a number of dramatic battles between Tom Barry and the Essex Regiment, culminating in the Cross Barry ambush in March of 1921, when he led 100 men out of an attempted encirclement by over 1,200 British soldiers. While British sources argue that the Essex Regiment's reputation was earned because of their effectiveness in combating the IRA, Major Percival is still remembered in West Cork today as a brutal sadist who reveled in torture. In April of 1921, he burned Michael Collins's family home at Woodfield to the ground, and while numerous attempts were made to kill him, he survived the War of Independence and was heavily decorated for his actions. In 1942, now Lieutenant General Percival, surrendered the British military fortress of Singapore to an Imperial Japanese army which they outnumbered almost three to one in what Winston Churchill would describe as the worst disaster in British military history. Though the auxiliaries and individual British military units began to develop counterinsurgency tactics and courses to combat the IRA, the Army's official history of what it termed the Rebellion in Ireland would never be published as it was too political, blaming the lack of clear government policy for their failure to defeat the IRA. As such, all the lessons learned would be forgotten, to be rediscovered after the Second World War in campaigns such as the Malayan Emergency, which is viewed as the start of British counterinsurgency operations. In future episodes, we'll see how British forces adapted to IRA guerrilla tactics, and how they in turn developed new strategies to compensate for this. All the while, Lloyd George slowly pushes the Government of Ireland bill through Westminster, hoping British forces could crush the IRA but recognising that he would also have to negotiate with Sinn Féin at some point in the future. And finally, as the first auxiliaries were arriving in Ireland in August of 1920, a military raid on Cork City Hall led to the arrest of the Lord Mayor, Terence McSweeney, who was found with what would be described as seditious articles and documents at his court-martial, held under the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act. Having gone on hunger strike following his arrest, McSweeney would draw worldwide attention to the plight of Ireland over the next 74 days, as his health slowly deteriorated and the British faced the choice of releasing him or allowing him to die. I'll be covering McSweeney's hunger strike and the other major events of the Irish War of Independence in future episodes. Please subscribe to be kept up to date, and if you have any suggestions for what you would like to see covered, leave them in the comments below. Accorda. Thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slong of all.